again. Uh, really great to be here together under the trees. Uh, once again, if you haven't already done so, you can download the bulletin on your phone. Just a really quick uh, word about masks. If you would please wear your mask as you're coming and going or anytime you're closer to do, uh, than six feet to somebody not in your family and when you're coming up for communion. Other than that, once you're kind of seated at these tables and stuff, uh, feel free to, to, not, to not have to wear it. Uh, you know, one of the wonderful things about the God that we serve is that he is a God who invites us. Whether you've been sitting in church pews or uh, church picnic tables, you know, your whole life, or this is the first time that you're in church, or maybe the first time in a long time, the truth is that God has invited you here. He has invited you here because he is a God who loves to draw close to us. He's a God who loves to draw near to us and invites us to draw near to him in response. Listen to these great words from Ephesians chapter one. May the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. Friends, we are here this morning to uh, come to know God more intimately. As amazing as that is, our creator has invited us to know him. Will you pray with me? Our Father, we do pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts today, that we might come to know something that is uh, indescribable, unknowable in many ways, but Lord, even so, you amazingly have called us to come and to get to know you better. We pray that you would reveal yourself to us here this morning, and we pray through Christ. Amen. You may be seated. 
Well, we uh, often say here that we're a church that desires to help people connect to God and to each other. That's what we're here for. And we've talked about uh, God as the inviter who wants us to come and connect with him. But here's the thing is that when we come to connect with God, when we come invited by God, when we come into his presence, we do so humbly. In fact, it's the only way that we can do so. If we're honest with ourselves, we get to look in the mirror and realize we are not who we should be. And we are far from that. We're not even usually who we want to be. And so when we come to connect with God, we do so confessing our sins together, falling on our knees before him and claiming and celebrating his wonderful grace. That's why every Sunday when we gather, we actually uh, confess our sins together. We join our voices together. We say it out loud so that our ears and our hearts can know and be taught how we are to come and approach the Lord together. We're going to use a confession that God's people have been using for quite some time. This comes out of uh, the 1929 Book of Common Prayer. Uh, some of you may know this prayer intimately. Others may be hearing it for the first time. Uh, wherever you are on that spectrum, let me invite you to join with me as we confess our sins together. Let's pray. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent, according to your promises declared to mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. Grant that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Let's just spend a few moments confessing our sins silently now. Lord, forgive us for the many ways that we stray. Forgive us for the many things that we have left undone. Forgive us for the ways that we have willfully been disobedient to you. And forgive us, Lord, simply for the brokenness of our heart and our world. We need you to come and heal us. We need your rescue. Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. Well, friends, the wonderful news is that for those who confess their sins to the Lord, there is truly a fountain of grace. Let me invite you to stand and hear these great words from 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's sing of that thanks now. Stay and sinners plunge. 
precious blood shall never lose its power. privilege of hearing from God's word this morning uh, from Josh Eby. Uh, Josh is a pastor in Austin, and as I was sitting around with some friends the other day, uh, mentioned Josh, and I know him from my time in Austin, and then Jim spoke up and said, oh, I know Josh from Knoxville, and Olivia Baker spoke up and said, oh, I know Josh from Peru. So Josh gets around, and uh, we're excited that he has gotten around to us today, and we're going to hear about our good shepherd uh, today from Josh. So thanks, Josh, for being here. Great. Thank you for having me. Uh, joy and privilege to be here. Whoa. We okay? All right. Um, I was privileged in some of the early days of hope to gather with some of you in Gary's living room and dream and pray about what this might become. And so what a joy and privilege to see God's grace and goodness to you. Um, we're going to read from Psalm 23 today this familiar passage to us, but I think a timely word for us. Hear God's word. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that you are God who invites us. And now as you invite us into this portion of your word, we ask that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to understand, and wills to obey, that we might see Jesus high and lifted up as a king of glory. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, as you know, we are living in crazy days. We are living in unprecedented times. We hear these phrases thrown about, and they are true. And I don't know how crazy these days have been for you or what this has entailed for your personal household. Do I need to do something else? You want to turn this off? That's all right.
Is that better for everybody? Yes, okay, good. Um, so I don't know exactly how it's been crazy for you. Uh, let me share just a little bit in our household. Um, our son, our oldest son, uh, was set to graduate from college and learned in middle March that uh, during spring break week that you have a couple days to move out of your apartment on campus and figure out where you're gonna finish college. Uh, so by God's grace, he came home to live with us and finish college over Zoom. Uh, our only daughter is graduating, was graduating from high school this spring, and so all the things that she was expecting to do uh, were canceled. Uh, thankfully, she was able to graduate in person and is excited about the future, but obviously has lots of fears about the future as uh, her college has made some preliminary plans, but don't know exactly what those plans are going to be. Uh, work and rhythms for our family have been upended just like they've been for all of your households. So we are living in unprecedented times. But these unprecedented times call for the people of God to always have in their hands two books. The first book is the news or the newspaper uh, or however you ingest the news uh, through your device or on your phone. Uh, we're called to be people who know our world. We're called to be people who listen to our world, who hear the cries and the hopes and the fears and the aspirations and the dreams of our world. And we're living in times where people are crying out. And we can turn to the news, turn to any media source, and we can hear about those longings. We can hear about those cries. And as a people of God, we are to listen. But we're to listen with this other book that's open, and that is the Bible, God's Word. Because we need the wisdom of God to be able to respond to our world, to be able to respond to the news that we hear and read about each and every day. And you see, if we only have the newspaper that we're listening to, we're not going to know how to beautifully and wisely and well respond to the needs of our world. But if we only have the Bible open to us, we're not going to know how to implement the wisdom of God in our world. And so we need both. We need to be attentive to our world's cries, and we need to be attentive to the wisdom of God's word. And both are needed. And this morning in particular, we need the wisdom of Psalm 23. And this morning I want to ask us, through Psalm 23, what type of person are you seeking to be? What type of person are you becoming? David Brooks, a number of years ago, wrote an article about two types of people in our world and two types of virtues that shape us as a culture. He said the first type of virtue that takes precedent in our world and precedent in our culture are the competitive virtues, things like toughness, things like power, things like authority. He said, these virtues shape us to become people like Tony Stark. And these are the stories that we tell in our world, how to become just like Tony Stark. And he said, out of vogue, out of style, are the compassionate virtues, things like gentleness, humility, forgiveness, kindness, patience, things that shape us to become people like Mr. Rogers. And he asked the question, what type of person are you being formed and shaped to be? What type of virtues are forming and shaping your life? Are you more shaped by the competitive virtues or by the compassionate virtues? And I believe that Psalm 23 wants us to ask the question, who are we becoming? Who does God invite us to become as people, as sheep? And so I want us to look at three things from Psalm 23. I want us to look at why we need a shepherd, when we need a shepherd, and then who is our shepherd. First, why do we need a shepherd? Well, we need a shepherd simply because we are all sheep. We are all finite creatures. We all need wisdom, guidance, somebody to go before us and to show us this way. 
we are finite creatures who easily get lost. And this season in particular highlights the need for us to, for us to have shepherds, for us to have a true shepherd, a shepherd who knows how to lead and guide us through these paths that we've all endured for the last few months. That great theologian Mike Tyson once said, everybody has a plan until he gets punched in the mouth. And these last few months have punched us all in the mouth. I don't know all the particular ways in which you have been punched in the mouth, but I know that you have been punched in the mouth. Your life has been more out of control these days. Your future isn't as secure these days. And these days have just highlighted the fact that you are a finite creature who is a sheep in need of a shepherd. And we all have different types of shepherds in our lives. Some of us have financial shepherds that help us to navigate our finances. Some of us have health shepherds that help us to navigate uh, our, our, our bodies and physical health. Some of us have professional shepherds that help us to navigate career paths and career decisions. Uh, some of us have educational shepherds that help us to figure out uh, you know, what to pursue in terms of our educational endeavors. We all need shepherds, but we need a shepherd who is bigger and wiser and truer than all these other shepherds that we look to in our lives because we are sheep and we need somebody who can guide us. We need somebody who can go before us and say, this is the way, these are the paths that you are to walk upon as sheep. So we need a shepherd because we're finite creatures, but we also need a shepherd because this world is too vast, too scary, too big for us as sheep without a shepherd. These past few months have highlighted the vastness of our world, the largeness of our world, and they've highlighted our smallness. During these past few months, we've heard things that people in our world don't normally say. Uh, the experts are not speaking with such confidence as they did a few months ago. We're hearing things like, nobody knows. These are unprecedented times. This is the first time for all of us we don't know what tomorrow will bring. This world is too vast, this world is too big, this world is too scary, and we need a shepherd. So friends, this psalm invites you, God's word this morning invites you to say, do you see yourself as a sheep? Do you see yourself as a sheep in need of a wise and true and faithful shepherd? Every single one of us, no matter how young or how old you are, how poor or how rich you are, how educated or uneducated you are, every single one of us here this morning needs a shepherd. And the biblical God is inviting us to listen to his wisdom as our shepherd. Secondly, when do you need a shepherd? When do you need a shepherd? Well, Psalm 23 describes three different seasons in the sheep's life. It describes the springtime of a sheep's life, the summertime of a sheep's life, and also the fall of a sheep's life. So first, the springtime of a sheep's life. This psalm opens up with these beautiful words around the springtime of life. I lie down in green pastures. I'm led beside still waters. My soul is restored. Now, I've never been a shepherd. I don't know much about sheep, so my knowledge of sheep from an agricultural perspective is just through books or talking to other people. But one thing that people will say is that sheep don't know how to rest. And that the only time that sheep really do truly rest is when the shepherd leads them to these verdant grasses and these still cool waters. Israel is a dry society doesn't get much rain, gets rain in the, the winter months, January and February. And in January and February, when the rain comes, the grass grows in Israel, the pools fill up, and life for sheep in the springtime of Israel is good because you can find grass, you can find water, 
you can rest. Some of you this morning are in the springtime of life. Some of you are thinking about life with high hopes, high dreams, high expectations, new relationships, new work, new opportunities. And it's the springtime of your life. And life overall is good. Even in the midst of these turbulent and difficult times, life is good. And if that's you this morning, if you're enjoying the springtime of life, enjoy these days. These days are a gift of God to you. These are gifts from your shepherd who knows you, who loves you, who cares for you. And he's giving you these gifts so that you can find rest in him. So springtime of life, when life is full of hopes and dreams and aspirations, when you can rest. But then summer is coming. Summer came for sheep in Israel, and what that meant if you were a shepherd leading a flock in Israel is that you had to move from the mountains of Jerusalem, and you had to go down the valleys to look for new grass, to look for, look for new water, because everything had dried up and everything had withered away. And you had to walk down the mountains through difficult and treacherous paths to find new grass and new water for your sheep. Summer was difficult for the sheep. They had to get up and move. They had to walk down these difficult paths. They didn't know the future. They didn't know what the heat would bring. But this shepherd says to them, you can trust me. I know these paths. I've walked down these paths before and I'm gonna lead you even in the heat of summer to new grass, to new water, to new life. Friends, many of us are in the summertime of life right now. These days that have been upon us for the last few months, they have been the heat of summer. Our stress levels are higher. Our anxiety levels are higher. Our depression levels are higher. The heat has been turned up for us and we are in the summer of life. And I don't know exactly how you're in face, enduring and facing the heat, but as you endure and face the heat, receive these days as well as a gift from your shepherd. Because these days have been given to you to form you and to shape you to be more dependent upon him. And for most of us, we live in the tension between springtime and summertime. We live in the tension between looking at our lives and being able to say, I can count so many blessings. I can be full of so much gratitude for all the ways that God has been abundantly gracious to me. And then we can look at the summer and say, these things are hard. These things are difficult. These things are trying in my life. This is how I'm enduring so much heat. We know how this goes for those of us who live here in Central Texas. Because imagine it's a beautiful February day and you're in a place kind of like this. You're out with some friends or family uh, enjoying a, a, a beautiful meal, uh, a beautiful deck, a beautiful patio, and the conversation goes like this. Isn't this amazing? We get to live in Central Texas in February and sit outside and enjoy a meal outside in this beautiful sunshine. Isn't this incredible? And then somebody in the group will always say this, yes, this is good, this is amazing, but July is coming. July is on its way. Summer is coming, summer is coming, and in July, it's gonna be 109 degrees. And we're gonna hate living in Central Texas in July. And you see, that's what most of life is for us, receiving God's bountiful grace to us, the many, many gifts that he has for us while also enduring difficulties and trials. I've got a friend who uh, many years ago was in a single day in the hospital and in one room his wife was giving birth to their first child, a son. The springtime of life, so much joy, so much hope, 
so many aspirations about being a father and raising a son. And in the other room, his dad was dying. And he spent his entire day going back and forth between the labor and the living room and the room where his father eventually passed away. At his wife's side, coaching her, encouraging her, and at his dad's side, praying with him and saying goodbye to him. The same day, his son was born and his father died. Now that's an extreme example of springtime and summertime being present realities for all of us, but that's true for us. We are sheep who have to learn how to navigate the springtime of life and the summertime of life. How to enjoy the good gifts that God entrusts to us and how to embrace and endure the more challenging gifts that God gives to us. And this leads us into the fall. How do we as sheep become formed and shaped to become the people that God calls us to be, invites us to be, and that wants us to become? Now, if you were a sheep living in Israel and you made it to the fall, guess what that meant for you? Guess what that meant for Israel? The fall was feasting time. The fall was celebration time. The fall was party time. The fall was cookout time. Time to eat lamb. Lots of it. And all Israel would have these huge celebrations to come together and to celebrate the goodness of God by eating and feasting upon lamb. But look at what Psalm 23 says to us. Verses 5 you prepare a table before me. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Did you see it? A table is prepared for the sheep. The sheep are not placed on the table. And friends, this is the heart of Christianity. This is the heart of the biblical drama. God is not out to consume you. God is not out to eat you. God is not out to kill you. God is out to provide for you, to feast with you, to give himself to you, to provide food for you, the sheep. And when you begin to understand that this is the heart of our God. It truly transforms everything. So why do you need a sheep? Or why do you need a shepherd? Because you are a sheep. When do you need a shepherd? Throughout all the seasons of life. And then finally, who is your shepherd? Verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd. Friends, your shepherd is the Lord, the faithful God the covenant-keeping God, the one who makes good on all of his promises, the one who is Moses' shepherd, the one who is David's shepherd, the one who is Daniel's shepherd, who led them and cared for them and walked with them through their paths, the one who is with you to walk with you down the paths that he's prepared for you. And friends, your shepherd, the Lord, has a son. And your shepherd, the Lord, was the shepherd to his son. He was faithful to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus had a father. Jesus had a shepherd. Jesus had somebody who was with him and beside him to care for him, to encourage him, to strengthen him, to nourish him for the journey that his father had prepared for him. And Jesus, our lamb, when it was time for him to walk down these paths, he didn't merely walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He was consumed by death. He died. He was buried. But then three days later, he rose again. And his father was faithful to him to invite him into his presence at his right hand and to say, my son, sit with me and share this kingdom with me. And now Jesus as a risen and reigning Lord. 
cares for his sheep, sheep like you, sheep like me. And we can trust our shepherd because our shepherd has walked down these paths. He's walked down everything that we've faced. He's walked down everything that we've endured. And he has been faithful and he will continue to be faithful. The heart of this psalm, the middle of this psalm, are these words in verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The very middle of the psalm, you are with me. And friends, this is the heart of the Christian story. This is the heart of the gospel. God is with us. God is for us. God is with us as we walk down these paths. My paths are different than your paths. But God is with us to love us, to care for us, to support us, to encourage us, and to strengthen us. And to remind us, day in and day out, week in and week out, especially as we gather in his name in worship, that friends, you are not the lamb. You are not the lamb. You are not the sacrifice. A lamb has been provided for you. Jesus is the lamb. And when you really understand that God is not out to get you, but God is with you, and God is here for you, and God is present to you in countless gracious ways, your lives will be transformed. My life will be transformed. And we'll become under shepherds in his name. We'll become people who are able to go out into our households, into our schools, into our neighborhoods, into our cities, and say and bear witness to the reality that we have a shepherd. We have a good shepherd. And we'll be able to love and care and serve and forgive and provide for those that God has entrusted to us in his name because we know that our lives are secure in him. And by his grace, we'll be more and more marked by the compassionate virtues to become people who forgive, to become people who love, to become people who serve, to become people who give our lives away for the sake of others, even in these unprecedented and crazy times because we know who we are, because we know who our shepherd is. And friends, that's what Psalm 23 is calling us to, to rest, to believe, to be assured that your shepherd loves you, that your shepherd is for you. And friends, in just a minute, we're gonna be invited by this good shepherd to his table. He's preparing a table for us, and he will prepare a table for us. And this is a day, today, this Sunday, where we, in small but real ways, get to dwell in his house. In small but real ways, we get to taste of his love and goodness and grace toward us, where we get to feast in him, knowing that he's given the lamb to us, knowing that he's not out to consume us, but to give himself for us. Let me pray for us. Father, we do thank you that you are the God who gives yourself to your people, that you are the God who walks with your people through all the seasons of life, through all the highs and lows, peaks and valleys, twists and turns that life brings, and that you are the God who is truly with us and truly for us, and that you are the God who prepares tables, prepares feasts, fills our cup, who provides your goodness and mercy. Lord, may we learn a little bit more today to rest in you as our shepherd, and by your grace to become an under-shepherd in Christ's name, because we belong to him. Help us to be sent from this place to love and serve our households, our neighborhoods, our, our communities, in the hope of belonging to Jesus, the Good Shepherd. 
In his name we pray. Amen. <laughs> takes away the sin of the world was what the Apostle John said of Jesus when he saw him first the good shepherd who has become the good sheep who has laid himself down for us we come to celebrate that together around his table let me just remind you before you come that there are two opposite errors that we can bring to God's table one is to come thinking that we have something to give come thinking that we have something in our hands to bring God and we are coming to his table with some sense of earning that we have brought our righteousness or our activity or our good works or whatever it is and we have there are then making an exchange and taking grace then from God friends if that is your conception I would invite you actually to stay put and to deal with the Lord and to wrestle with your sin and his grace because we do not come with full hands but with empty hands the second error maybe is one that's more common with us is that we can come thinking that we're just here to kind of gather up the crumbs that jesus has asked us to come but he hasn't really given us the full meal that is also wrong when we come to god's table we come to be fed bountifully from him we come as those who get to sit as children we come as sheep who have our good shepherd spreading out a banquet for us, even in the presence of our enemies, sometimes that enemy is our own guilt and shame. And so let me invite you, if you are wrestling with that today, to come and be fed by God's table, to come and be reminded that your good shepherd loves you and has given his life for you and feeds you willingly from his table. If you belong to Jesus, if he is yours by faith, then this table is yours, and we would invite you to come. Let me pray for us. Father, we are so thankful to hear these words that Josh has spoken to us of our need for a shepherd and uh, our need that runs continually through the different seasons of our lives. And Lord, that you have perfectly, and fully, and finally filled that need with yourself. The good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. That's our story. That's what we celebrate when we come to your table. Well, we come with a lot of things that are on our hearts and minds today, as Josh has reminded us. Uh, we live in strange times, and a lot of us are wrestling through a lot of that. But Lord, even in the midst of this, though these times are unprecedented in our lives, they are not unprecedented for you. They are not strange to you. Lord, your kingdom will come. We get to pray for it because it's promised. And so we ask that it would spread in this world and in our lives, our own hearts, and in our city. Lord, we do pray for local missions around for Vita House in Austin and for Josh as he leads that mission. For Redemption Bible Church here uh, in New Braunfels and for Blair Cushman, the church planter. Lord, for schools and for campus ministries and for teachers and administrators who are doing the really difficult work of figuring out what to do in the fall, we pray for wisdom. And Lord, for our city, we pray that the citizens of New Braunfels uh, would value what you value, that the character that uh, you value would be knit into their hearts, that they would care for the lonely, the abused, the oppressed, the abandoned, the hungry, the marginalized, that we would fight for justice and for mercy, that we would want, love one another as you have loved us. Father, we also pray for your kingdom to expand in this world for Rachel, ba Rachel Bowserman in Japan. We're, we're thankful that you, have, um, that you have given her that, that goal, that she's reached her, her fundraising goal, and you'll be sending her back soon. And we pray, Lord, for our country, 
that even in the midst of difficulty and divisiveness, and it's everywhere, that you would unify us, but that you would unify us, Lord, under our common need and a common Savior. Lord, for those in our midst, we pray for healing, for Lizzie Armstrong, for David and Vera Crawford, that you would keep them safe, for continued recovery for Jake Wharton, or for Michelle Lighty's mom, Nancy Johnson, for continued recovery for her, for Elaine Baker, Lord, even as she transfer, transitions into hospice care. We pray your care, your blessing, your grace. And Lord, as we come to your table now, we lift our voices with the angels who have been singing the song of your grace for ages, the glory of your Trinitarian name. That is what we sing today. in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat this in remembrance of me. And then likewise, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this, is the, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which has been poured out for you and for many. Drink this also in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink of this cup and you eat of this bread, you proclaim the Lamb of God, his life and death, his resurrection and ascension, and his coming again. That is what we proclaim this morning, friends. These are the gifts of God given to the people of God. We'll come forward like we have in the last few weeks. If you wouldn't mind wearing a mask to come up and grab uh, either regular or gluten-free bread, there's, uh, there's both on the table, and grab uh, a cup. It's either wine or juice. The wine is in the larger portion, the cup in the smaller. Bring it back to your place, and we will sing, and when we're finished singing, we will eat and drink together. Uh, come now to the table of the Lord.
God, which takes away the sins of the world, the body of Christ, take and eat. In the blood of Christ, the fountain of mercy, which covers all of our sins, take and drink. pray. What a privilege, Lord, to come to your table. We ask now, Good Shepherd, that in doing so, you would shape in us the character uh, that you would, the kind of people that you would have us to be, that we might go out from this table uh, and we might proclaim that goodness to all of those around us, that we might actually be the body and the blood of Christ for the world around, that we might pour ourselves out for the life of the world you have done for us. I pray that you would send us in that way today. Amen. Stand. Praise God from you all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and look up and receive the Lord's benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be merciful to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you his peace. Go in that peace today. Amen. Amen.